take in about World of Warcraft Legion? Yeah. I mean, we're going to have uh, the, the Legion game, si uh, game Systems panel coming up here uh, in just a few minutes. But, Michelle, what what is the thing that you're the most excited about to learn about? I mean, is it class order halls? Is oh, it the artifact God. weapon? Is it the new class design? That's like, that's I mean, like making me pick one of my babies, Alex. Well, it's this so is difficult. This is my favorite, favorite game of all time. Um, you know, for me, I think class order halls is Big. really cool. Big deal. Um, I really liked the way that Garrison started in, in Warlords of Draenor. Yeah. Um, and then it's sort of, you lost the world. You know, and that's kind of the point is that this is the world of Warcraft. And you loved when you went to your home city and you felt like you saw everybody around, some boom chicken dancing on a mailbox, <laughs> whatever. But the thing was is that it felt like a world. I love that what we're doing is bringing back the fantasy of the class yeah. and saying like, hey, if you're a hunter, all the hunters go here. If you're a priest, all the priests go here. Just like how they have with the DKs. So it's, it's, it's awesome to me. Um, and it's cool too because it creates class community. Yes. And there's a lot of very big class pride that goes on with World of Warcraft. Of so, you know, something like Hunters, myself, I can speak specifically, is we have uh, the Warcraft Hunters Union. And there's all these, all these hunters that get together. There's even a podcast and everything, but we're talking 600 hunters would get together. That's a lot of on hunters. On one server, we actually crashed uh, we crashed one of the servers because we went and raided Thunder Bluff. Oh, My little horde heart died inside, but it's a, it was an all dwarven <laughs> raid. It was neat though because it inspired the fact that, you know, although we didn't have any healers with us, yeah. could we as hunters all come together and do something massive? And, and they haven't talked take down about. A boss. They also haven't talked about where these class order halls are going to exist. I mean, as a hunter, you can imagine going out into the wilderness yes. and having this location that potentially only hunters can go to and having this sort of like camp, you know. I know, I'm thinking original rangers and, you know, I yeah. really like Elven and, and I, I mean, I don't know. At the same, I, it, it's hard to say exactly yeah. where everything is going to and end druid, up. And druid, so I had a druid for a very long time, st still do, obviously. Uh, but with druids had, it was, was Moonglade or Moon? Yeah. I think it was Moonglade. Moonglade. Uh, which was this location that you could only get to. Yep, if, as I mean, a you druid. could get there. But, uh, they're spoiled. Because jurors are spoiled. But it was so great because you would go. <laughs> and the other thing that I, you know, they've talked about is that it's not, it's non-denominational, as they say. Yeah, yeah. Right? You're going to see Horde. You're going to see Alliance. But I feel like that's, it, it, it allows you to have that sort of semi-camaraderie of the, like, look, we're all shooting arrows at people. Yeah. You know, we're all slinging our cannons. Well, I'm just fireballs. wondering how much we're going to see community come together through class because of these class order, order halls. Yeah, and how much time you need to spend in there. I mean, there's a lot of information about them that we don't know. It was great when Corey was talking about the fact that, you know, they're not going to force you into this sort of, oh my God, it's it's 5 a.m., I got to make sure I get in and do my, my, daily. know, my dailies, right, yeah, otherwise yeah. I got to go to work, you know what I mean? The fact that it's less about touching it every day, yeah, yeah. but also we don't know exactly what you have to do in there, so you don't know exactly, you know, are the professions going to be oh, done professions? in there? We haven't even talked about, they haven't professions? Talked about professions. I, I am dying for a profession revamp, that's for sure, uh, because they used to be so important to oh, min max your character. Yeah, if somebody in my raid didn't have their char their character min maxed with their professions, I was yeah. like, you're not raiding until that's completely done because you're gonna get extra stats. Dude, so I made so much money on flasks, it wasn't even funny. <laughs> and now it's like, ah, you can do it with a flask, or man, yeah, it's all right. And it'll be interesting too to see demon hunters. I mean, they only have two Huge. specs. That's it. Huge. All right. Well, a lot of those questions are gonna be answered ah. right now. We're sending you into Hall D for the World of Warcraft Legion's Game Systems Panel. I'm so excited! Welcome to the World of Warcraft Legion Game Systems Panel. BlizzCon! <laughs> Welcome to the World of Warcraft Game Systems panel. Uh, we have an hour-long information overload that we're going to do for you, and hopefully we have enough time to do it, so we're going to get started right away. Today we're going to talk to you about items, we're going to talk to you about professions, classes, the Demon Hunter, but first, Mr. Craig Amai is going to walk you through artifacts 
and class halls. Great. Hello, BlizzCon. Everyone having a good time today? Awesome. So my name is Craig Amai. I've been heading up the artifact feature for Legion. Uh, I know a few of you probably got glimpses at some of the artifacts at Gamescom. What I want to do for you today is I want to dive a lot deeper into the system and kind of show you what it's going to be like to play with an artifact. Uh, to do that, I'm going to focus on one specific artifact first. This is not that artifact. <laughs> nah, I don't, I, I don't really think that's going to cut it either. Okay. Here we go. This is the Deadwind Harvester. This is a scythe created by Sargeras, given to the first Necrolite that he sent to Azeroth. Uh, it earned its name and its reputation in part by purging much of the life from Deadwind Pass. Uh, Affliction Warlocks are going to be hunting down this scythe and making it their own for Legion. So at the start of the expansion, as a Warlock, you're going to get together with the Council of the Black Harvest, and you're going to open a gateway to one of the Legion's bases deep within the Nether. Uh, things don't exactly go according to plan there, but you do manage to steal a little bit of information about some artifacts that the Legion knows about back on Azeroth, the Deadwood Harvester being one of them. So using that information, you go to Duskwood. You follow the trail of the Dark Riders of the Karazhan through, De uh, Dark Riders of Karazhan through Deadwind Pass, uh, and you end up uncovering a series of catacombs beneath Karazhan that somehow evaded our notice to this time. So in those catacombs, you confront the leader of the Dark Riders, and you take the Deadwind Harvester and make it your own. Um, from the moment you have your hands on the scythe, you're going to start feeling some of its effects in combat. This is a soul-stealing weapon. So every time you kill something, the scythe surges with power, and your spells do increase damage for a time. Uh, on top of that, the souls within the scythe, they're kind of restless. So every now and then, one of them will try and break free and escape. And you can easily reap that soul, gaining the same benefits as if you had killed something fresh. So that, that acts kind of as a way of reinforcing the fantasy of the weapon, but also as a mechanic that can help you out in certain environments like arenas and raid encounters where you don't readily have many things to kill. So scythe in hand, you head out to the Broken Isles. In the Broken Isles, you start accruing artifact power from a number of different sources. Uh, so artifact power is a sort of resource uh, that you will eventually use to unlock new abilities within your weapon. Uh, it comes from many different sources. It comes from quest bosses and rare spawns. It comes from special items that you find and break open and release the power from to absorb into your weapon. It also comes from things like uh, arenas and battlegrounds. Uh, so basically, whatever types of activities you're participating in in Legion, uh, you're going to be gathering artifact power along the way, and you're going to be growing your weapon alongside you. So gain enough artifact power, and you can unlock a new trait in your artifact tree. Uh, this is kind of a glimpse at the Deadwind Harvester's uh, uh, trait tree. Uh, that first ability you're seeing there, that's the one I talked about. You don't actually need to spend artifact power to unlock that. You start with that. Uh, the, the first thing you're actually going to use your artifact power to unlock is an active trait, uh, an ability that you're actually going to put on your bar and use to unleash the power of your weapon against your enemies. Uh, so in the case of the Deadwind Harvester, that's this. Uh, you, 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 you release the souls from the scythe, they swirl around your enemy and they do massively ramping damage over time. So it's sort of super dot, long duration, long cooldown. Uh, so you use it on really meaty targets like quest bosses and raid bosses. After you unlock that first major active trait, your tree is going to open up to you and you're going to start seeing options about which direction you want to pursue. Uh, you'll be making choices like the difference between uh, increasing the critical strike chance on unstable affliction or the burst damage on Seed of Corruption, so single target versus AoE. Uh, these these uh, minor traits, they have multiple ranks and you have to unlock typically all three ranks to progress further into the tree. There are some special one-point traits within the tree as well uh, that usually are more utility-focused. Uh, in the case of Deadwind Harvester, there's one that causes your health stone to become a full heal and causes you to yield some health back whenever anyone in your party or raid uses a health stone as well. Uh, what's really going to be influencing where you go in these trees are major traits at the far extents of the tree. These are typically a bit more transformative, a bit more powerful. Uh, they'll modify or add on to major class abilities within your kit, or sometimes to the core artifact ability itself. So in the case of Deadwood Harvester, one of those traits uh, makes every soul you reap explode in shadow flame damage, hurting everything around it. 
Uh, there's, a, there's one for the Retribution Paladins, for Ashbringer, that causes your Divine Storm to unleash a whirlwind of holy energy in front of you, creating some direction, directionality to your primary, primary AoE button. So eventually you will be able to unlock every single trait within this tree, but it's going to take a while. Uh, that first active trait you'll get almost immediately. You'll unlock that shortly after obtaining the weapon. You'll get to the first gold power probably shortly before max, power, uh, max level, a uh, major trait, shortly before max level. Uh, the rest of the tree, it's likely going to take you months into expansion to fully unfold all of these things. Uh, and even on top of that, there's some incremental power increases that you can continue to pour artifact power into uh, over time. So your weapon will be growing with you for the entirety of Legion. So, you're also going to be seeing a new type of item dropping out in the Broken Isles, in, in all of Legion, uh, relics. These are special items that you can socket into your artifact to increase its power. Uh, so, they, have, they increase power in a couple of ways. They increase the item level of the weapon, increasing its stats, and uh, they increase it by higher item levels for higher quality relics further into the expansion. Uh, but they also give you bonus ranks in those traits that I was talking about. So, Whereas normally you'd only be able to get three ranks in increasing your Shadow Bolt damage, you can get a relic that could increase that to four or five ranks and, and further specialize on doing more damage in Shadow Bolt specifically. So this kind of gives you a form of specialization or customization uh, for the types of gameplay that you are most interested in. Do you want to be more about burst AoE damage or more about your primary single target rotation on raid bosses? Or do you do a lot of PvP and you want to focus on your survivability uh, abilities a, a little bit more? Those relics over time uh, will, will eventually actually be able to tap into those major traits as well, taking something that was normally only one rank and allowing you to increase its power too. So these relics come in many different types. Uh, if you look at the top of the Deadwood Harvester here, you'll see two symbols. Uh, those indicate the types that the Deadwood Harvester can, can uh, accept. So one of those is a shadow slot, one of those is a, a fell slot. Um, there are many other different types of relics, fire relics, water relics, earth relics. Uh, the Ashbringer has a slot for a holy and a fire, so different people are going to be seeking out different relics in Legion. Now, you have your artifact in hand for a while, and you will eventually, uh, once you reach max level, level 110 in Legion, you'll reach a moment when you can upgrade it. You'll undergo a quest line involving uh, some outdoor content, uh, interacting with some of the major factions of Legion, uh, and some dungeon content culminating in this major upgrade moment. Uh, at this moment, you'll unlock an additional relic slot for your weapon, further increasing the uh, specialization options available to you. Uh, but you'll also unlock a new model for your weapon as well. In the case of Deadwind Harvester, this is what the upgrade model looks like. So even past that, there are more quest lines you're going to be able to tap into, specializing in different types of content that will give you access to other models for your weapon over time. A Deadwood Harvester has a few more that you can see up here. And even beyond these models, uh, we also have many different colors you can unlock for each model based off the same types of content that it focused on originally. Uh, you can kind of see the interface for what some of those color swaps might look like for the Deadwind Harvester. Um, so these come in the form of more, more like achievements. Uh, finish all of the questing zones or earn exalted with uh, certain factions in, in the expansion that might unlock certain colors. But they'll also tap into uh, aspects of the artifact's history as well. So there might be a specific color that is unlocked by slaying a villain who previously killed one of the, the owners that had this artifact before you did, or going to locations in the world that are significant to your weapon specifically. So that's a pretty good overview of artifact systems. There's a lot of things I haven't talked about here, specifically uh, when it comes to the personality of the individual weapons and how you're going to feel them in the world. But I've talked a lot about Deadwind Harvester. I want to give you guys a little bit of a glimpse of some of the artif other artifacts you're going to see in Legion. So we have a video for you. Enjoy.
I agree. Okay, so I know a few of you probably thought you were done with me after that, but my team is also heading up class halls for this expansion. So I've got some more details to share with you today. Um, class halls, you may have also heard them referred to as order halls uh, sometimes. Those are actually the same thing, class halls, order halls. Uh, so uh, for class halls, before I dive fully into some of the things you can expect to see inside of them, I want to talk first about some of the major goals we had in identifying which class hall we would give to each class this expansion. Uh, our first big goal was that whatever location we chose, it was really important to us that you feel like your class when you're inside of it, that you feel like a warrior or a mage or a warlock when you're in that space. Uh, and that really, that really is to say, like, you think of a place like Frey Island for warriors. It's, it's a place that's very significant to warriors who've been around a while as a place where they got their berserker stance originally. It's got a lot of significance to them. But Frey Islands, ultimately, it's a desert island with some wooden buildings on it. So it doesn't quite meet the cut for what we're trying to achieve with class halls. We want, we want you to feel more like a warrior when you're in that space. Uh, our second major goal was that whatever groups we were going to bring together around these class halls, uh, they should welcome in the greatest breadth of class fantasy possible into that space. Using warriors again as an example, some warriors see themselves as the barbarian or the berserker with rippling muscles, solving their problems with strength instead of words. Other warriors see themselves as the, the gleaming knight with silver armor, crested shield, fighting for what is right. And yet other warriors see themselves as the, the grizzled veteran of the battlefield, fighting with dual blades and practice strikes. And all of those are absolutely warriors, and they should all feel at home within this space. So we want to make sure whatever groups we're bringing together, they do that. They bring them all in and make them all feel like a part of this effort. Lastly, uh, these class orders are forming around the threat of the Legion. They are stepping up when the conflicts between the Alliance and Horde are rising, and they are fighting the demonic hordes. They're acting on the front lines. So the groups we're putting, putting forward for this, it's really critical that they have every reason to, to be that force that stands against the Legion. That again spells the difference between some old groups you may recognize and the new groups we put together to, to focus on these efforts. So I have to warn you guys ahead of time, I'm not going to be able to show you every single class hall during this presentation. I really want to, but I cannot. We, we just have too many awesome things to talk about today. Uh, so I'm going to show you one class hall. Uh, I'm going to talk about how we identified the location. Uh, and I'm also going to give you some glimpses at a few others as we talk about the features you can expect to see inside of them. So do I have any druids in the audience today? <laughs> Hello, druids. Uh, so Druids are one of the few classes that kind of had a class hall already. Like Moonglade is one of the very first places we thought of when we were trying to identify all the locations for all the various classes. Uh, and Moonglade, it gets pretty close to hitting a lot of our goals up there. Um, it, it welcomes in a very large variety of Druids. Uh, it, and I can see this, the forces of Moonglade standing against the Legion. I think it could do a better job immersing druids in, in nature, surrounding them with uh, na the, the natural elements you expect of, from being a druid. I also think that uh, it could create a better home for cat druids and bear druids. It could show the influences of the Emerald Dream better around you. That's something that's really critical to the druid fantasy. Uh, so there's, there's some opportunities, but it gets close. Moonglade is, is right there. At the same time, we have a unique opportunity this expansion. We're going to the Broken Isles. We're going to the forests of Val Shirah, where Druidism was essentially born within Azeroth, to, to a place where many of the most ancient Night Elves and Tauren basically invented the class for us. Uh, so we decided this expansion, we're going to give Druids the Dream Grove. The Dream Grove is a place where the fabric between the Emerald Dream and Azeroth is at its thinnest, and you can feel the, the influence of the dream all around you. It's a secret sanctum, well, not so secret now that I'm telling millions of people. Uh, it's a sanctum for druids only uh, that, that no other classes are allowed into. And it's a place where we can accomplish a lot of those things that we couldn't in Moonglade to, to fully surround you with nature and, and give a home for some of those other aspects of druidism in a more direct form. So this is gonna be, this is gonna be where druids are gonna be calling home for this expansion, Dream Grove. So uh, let's start talking really fast about uh, some of the other uh, features you can expect to see in class halls, uh, some, some of the things that you'll, you can expect to be interacting with really regularly. 
So within your class hall, you're going to find a special shrine or altar that you bring your artifact to, to unlock new traits and swap appearances. It takes different forms for each class. For druids, it, it takes the form of a tree that grows in front of you, forms a pool of water. You lay your weapon upon it, and you can, you can modify it. Uh, in, the core, in, in the case of shaman, uh, it's, a, it's a stone altar on the precipice of the maelstrom that's struck by lightning as you place your weapon down. Uh, as, you, as you wander your class halls, you can also expect to see your class champions uh, uh, within the space. Now, class champions are a very different breed from the garrison followers you may be used to from Draenor. Uh, they're typically much bigger figures, some of them leaders of, of factions in their own right. Uh, and, and they have a lot more personality. You're going to unfold their backstories over time as you interact with them, and you're going to see them in the world uh, a lot more significantly uh, than you did your, your followers in your garrison. Within your class halls, uh, you're also going to be interacting very regularly with your scouting map. Uh, so this is a new portal to content for Legion. It's, uh, you're going to go to it initially to choose which zone you want to start your questing experience in, but it's also going to continue to expose new content to you over time deep into the max level experience. So you'll be coming to it very regularly. There's also going to be a fair variety of different types of class content you can expect to see within your class halls. Uh, some of that takes the form of those major uh, artifact lines I was talking about earlier that will unlock new appearances for your spec-specific weapons. Uh, but there's also uh, intermittent little uh, flavorful things for specific classes. Uh, there's demon hunting quests and pickpocket quests that you can expect to see, and you can, I'll let you guess which class each one of those goes with. We also have a very large variety of different uh, features and bonuses that we're putting inside these halls. Some of them uh, shared among many classes like uh, armor stands to let you show off previous tier sets that you've gained from other raid content. Uh, but uh, also, uh, also a variety of kind of larger, more functional features. Uh, the hunters have a, a lodge in a high mountain where they have a special relationship with the giant eagles that are out in that space. And they can, uh, the giant eagles give them access to a special flight network that no one else has. Uh, the druids of Dreamgrove, they have access to the Dreamway, which is a pathway through the Emerald Dream, or I guess more appropriately, the Emerald Nightmare at this point, uh, that lets them reach many other natural places in the world very quickly. Uh, and warriors in their, in their class hall, they have a, an arena where they can spar with NPCs and other warriors uh, for bragging rights. Uh, so really, this expansion, you kind of have two different social locations. You've got your class halls, where you'll be interacting with other members of your class regularly. And you have Dalaran, which is going to have many of the, the features that you're used to from a major city, things like uh, auction house, bank, mailbox, profession quests. Uh, two different places for you to spam Thunder Fury and chat. Uh, so to make getting back and forth between those spaces a little bit easier, every class is going to have their own kind of different brand of Deathgate to let them get to their class hall quickly and get back to where they came from afterwards. So in the case of Hunters, it's a, a giant eagle that comes and picks you up that can take you back and forth. So uh, that's class halls. Uh, I've been talking to you a long time, and we've got a lot more things to share with you today. So I'm going to go ahead and pass this off to Jonathan LeCraft. Thank you, Craig. And hello to all you beautiful people. Now, before I get rolling here, uh, let, me, let me just ask a question. Is there, is there anyone here who's excited to play the Demon Hunter? <laughs> all right, me too. Uh, you can actually go play it right now. What are you guys doing here? <laughs> So let's, let's, uh, let's just dive in. Like, what, what is this class about? Well, the Demon Hunter is it's a dark hero. And I mean, these guys, they've sacrificed their souls just to fight a threat that most people don't even know exists. They are a melee class. They wear leather armor, not often on the shirt area. Um, and they... They take the weapons of the enemy and they use it against them. So, war glaives, fell magic, sculpted biceps, everything. And they look good. And speaking of, let's just talk for a second about character customization. As you can see, you can choose your horns, your blindfold, your tattoos, custom skin textures, 
All that stuff's on top of your regular uh, customization options too. And, and uh, something I, I don't think maybe a lot of people have noticed yet is uh, we did actually record, we wrote and record new VO for Demon Hunters. And that's things like train and flirt and silly. Uh, and unlike me, some of them are even funny. All right, so what's the point of looking good if you can't kick some ass, right? Havoc. Now this is the fast-paced melee DPS spec uh, with an emphasis on mobility. And their, their motto is fight fire with more fire. These guys, they have their own custom resource, Fury. Uh, and I think if I were to describe Fury, I'd say it's like rage. But, uh, you know, you throw in a little bit of smoldering hatred and a splash of purple, and voila. Um, but it is, it, it's, it's, but really though, it's your classic builder spender. Uh, you know, you build it up with the small attacks, you use it on the big attacks. Um, pretty straightforward. So let's, let's talk about how you use Fury. All right. So first up, Demon's Bite. I just want to kind of highlight some of these abilities here. Um, it actually generates a random amount of Fury. And then you've got its big brother here, Chaos Strike. This is your spender. But the cool thing about Chaos Strike is it doesn't actually spend any fury when you critically strike with it. So between those two abilities, you have a lot of variation in your core combat, just enough to keep you on your toes. And then lastly here, Throw Glaive. This is your ranged attack. Its fury cost has actually been replaced with a short cooldown, so you can always use it at the beginning of a fight. Uh, in addition, there's no minimum range, and it can hit multiple targets. So, a lot of places you might actually end up using that, you know, um, AE or, or even in melee. Uh, anyhow, so I, got, I have a short video I, guys want, I want to show you guys. It just shows off some of the glaive animations, and there's a cool attack right at the end. So that, that last ability is called Blade Dance. Uh, right now it's a talent, although we've been talking about maybe moving that to core functionality. Uh, all right, all right. Well, we talked about mobility earlier, so let's, let's, let's dive into how we actually accomplish that for the Demon Hunter. And first up, we've got Double Jump. I think this one kind of speaks for itself, yeah? All right. But then we've got Double Jump's buddy, and that's Glide. And you can think of this as, uh, it's basically like your own personal goblin glider. I guess everyone's goblin glider's personal, but with demon wings. And the cool thing about both of these is they can be activated with the jump key. So they're not taking up any room on your bar. <laughs> um, and then lastly, Vengeful Retreat Fell Rush. Okay, so these, these clearly have a lot of damage and utility you're gonna use in your regular combat. But uh, two things to note is that they don't require a target and they can be done while you're in the air. And just to kind of, just, I just want to show you guys what, like, how you might move around with these when you're outside of combat. Yeah. All right. I don't, I don't know if you guys know that game, The Floor is Lava, but they are really good at it, even with literal lava. OK. Ah, Fell Magic, yes. Now, this is where we're getting into some real power, the real punch. I mean, first up, you got Chaos Nova. And this is your nuclear level uh, CC, you know, AE stun. Five seconds has a big chunk of damage on top, just as a nice little kicker. Um, and you got I-Beam. This is a very powerful frontal cone attack. A uh, little bit of a skill shot. There's uh, about a two second channel and you can't move, but you can rotate and it's got pretty good range. And then lastly, consume magic. I, I would call this a, a medium range interrupt. And the, cool, uh, and the little bonus on this one is when you do interrupt someone, you get a full bar of fury. And you can do whatever you want with that. 
treat yourself. <laughs> OK, so I have a video for iBeam. Yes. All right, let's take a look at that. All right. So as you just saw with iBeam, and this is the same with Chaos Nova, actually, the, the inner demon kind of comes out and says, hey, now with metamorphosis, that demon comes out and murders everyone. So it starts, starts with this epic leap, slam down on the ground. You transform in the air, by the way. Stun everybody around you. Your damage has increased. Fury's coming in hot. And uh, oh yeah, you have 100% life leech while this is active. And what that means is you get a ton of defensibility, but it's through offense, which is very much the Demon Hunter vibe. And let me, go, let me just show you guys that leap that I'm talking about real quick. And roll it. All right, yeah. Night, by the way, that is, uh, I don't know if you noticed at the end, you keep all your mobility in that form, obviously. You got wings, it makes sense, right? So, spectral sight. Now this, this is the ability that lets you see through your demon hunter's eyes, or eye sockets, I guess. And, uh, and what that means is that enemies can't escape your gaze. It means you see through invisibility and stealth and even through physical barriers. And just to kind of show you what I mean by that last part, I, I do have another video. All right, yeah. Hey, we even got a little sneak peek of Throw Glaive in there, too. Uh, and that, by the way, they're moving kind of slow in that video because we did have a huge snare on there. That's been reduced already. Yay, buffs. They're happening. So, and that, and by the way, that ability is available for both specs. And, and so, second spec I want to talk about is Vengeance. Little bit of bad news that I don't have a ton of abilities to show you or like really heavy duty details because it is still in development. But there is a few things I can talk about. First up, this spec is a, is a demon inquisitor, which means they've really mastered the art of extracting information from the enemy. And they do this by inflicting pain through fire. So, you know, you've got flame whip and you've got firebrand and immolation aura, of course. Um, and in doing so, like, with this close proximity to demons, they have also picked up a lot of protective spells. Some of those are disruptive, some of them protect the demon hunter, some of them even protect other people. Um, and then on top of that, you know, we've got the glaze and we're kind of looking at some parry stuff. Anyways, I don't want to talk about too much stuff that's not really in yet. Uh, and then lastly, they of course have their own metamorphosis, and this is going to be very different from the other one. This will be a very strong defensive cooldown um, not necessarily tied to offense, because you don't always have that option as a tank. Uh, but, you know, kind of look at it, you think of it almost as like an immovable object. And what's really great about this form is it, it lends itself naturally to a lot of modifications through talents and artifact traits and the like. And that's unfortunately all I have for you guys today. But I am going to pass it off to Chris Zierhut, and he's going to tell you about all the rest of the classes. Thank you. Hello, BlizzCon. It's great to be back here again. I'm the lead class designer on World of Warcraft. I'm going to tell you a little bit about class changes for Legion. And Craig told you a lot about what we're doing with class fantasy and really delving into the fantasies with your class order halls, with your artifacts. We felt for class design, this was the perfect time to take a hard look at our classes and make sure they really deliver on the fantasy that they're about. So that was our goal, was to strengthen class and specialization fantasies. Now, what exactly makes a strong class fantasy? What does that even mean? We thought about it a lot, and it came down to three things for us in World of Warcraft. First, the class feels immersive. You feel like everything you do is completely involved in what that class is about. 
the abilities you're using, the names, the abilities, the animations, how they work together, it's all about that theme. They're distinct. They feel completely different from each other. Each class, each spec has some mechanic, some ability, some capability that nobody else has. It's unique to them. And they're empowering. You feel like your character is powerful. You have total control over what you're doing. You can accomplish these things you set out to do. Use your abilities the way you want to use them. It doesn't mean you're overpowered. You can just destroy everything, but that you have total control of your character. So how do we go about making some of our classes a little bit more empowering? One great example of a place that wasn't empower our game was Death Knight runes. You've got six runes of three different types. You also have death runes. And they all have different cooldowns and when they're coming up and when you have them. And you can't push the button you want to push when you want to push it because you're waiting on that rune to come back or, crap, I screwed up and I don't have the death rune I needed. So we cleaned all that up. There is now one type of rune. You still have six of them. The way you use your abilities together still matters, but you don't have to worry about staring at the UI. Instead, you're using the ability you want to use when you want to use it. Another great example is with the Fury Warrior. Right now, Fury Warrior is completely controlled by how many charges they have. You've got, you've got Enrage Up, you've got Raging Blow charges, you've got Meat Cleaver charges, you're tracking the UI, keeping track of all these buffs to decide what you can do when. Cleaned all that up. When you push Whirlwind, your abilities AOE for several seconds afterward. No, no need to pay attention to Meat Cleaver anymore. When you're enraged, you can use Raging Blow as much as you want. There's no more Raging Blow charges. So we clean that up. You're not staring at the UI to figure out what you can do. In general, we took that step of anywhere there was a stacking buff or debuff that was controlling how your character worked, we tried to either eliminate it from the game as much as possible or actually turn it into a resource. And that's what we did with Arcane. Arcane charges are now a resource in addition to mana instead of being this little buff you have to look up in the far right corner of your screen. On top of that, we really felt like Arcane was a spec that a really strong fantasy but when you actually played it, you didn't feel powerful. What it came down to is there's a very specific sequence. I pushed this button and this button and this button very, very carefully. And if you screwed up and pushed Arcane Blast a few too many times, now you're stuck for the whole rest of the fight. You're not, you know, you're, you've spent too much mana. You're not very powerful. The way Arcane man, mana worked is the more mana you have, the more damage you did. You spent too much mana, now you're not very good. So we said, let's, let's keep Arcane the way it is, but let's try to fix that problem. So their new mastery is called Savant. What it does is it increases how much mana you have, which works really well into how Arcane works, because if they have more mana, they can spend more mana on Arcane Blast. They can do more blasts. So the higher your mastery gets, the more often you can do that heavy burst damage. But even more importantly, because your mana level doesn't matter anymore, you can do it when you want to do it. You've got control of your character again. In addition, it also increases how much damage the Arcane charges uh, increase your Arcane Blast and their spells by. I want to talk to you a little bit about how we made the classes more distinct. Survival Hunter, you probably heard Ian Hazakostas at Gamescom hint they were going to have the Eagle Spear as their artifact. Well, it's a spear, that's, that's, that's a melee weapon, right? So going back to old 2004 World of Warcraft, Survival Hunter is going to be a melee spec, going toe-to-toe -to -toe in melee combat with their enemies, with their beasts fighting side-by-side -side with them with a the spear. Abilities like Harpoon, Raptor Strike, Mongoose Bite, Lacerate, all that stuff you remember back, but actually awesome this time. We took a hard look at the Discipline Priests. They really have always felt a little bit too much like just sort of a different flavor of the Holy Priest and not, didn't have enough of their own unique, distinct mechanics. They have power shield, and that's cool and that's fun, but that's, that's too narrow. There's not enough there. So we decided to make them really different from other healers. They have this other mechanic called Atonement. We decided to double down on Atonement. It is now their core healing mechanic. The way they heal is by dealing damage to their enemies. And that's how they get their primary means of healing. Very different from Holy. Similarly, our rogues always kind of felt similar to each other. In particular, Subtlety has this really cool, strong fantasy of being the master of shadows, the ninja, who teleports from place to place, moves around the battlefield. How could we strengthen that and make that even more distinct from the others? They have this really cool ability called Shadow Dance. It's a cooldown that lets them use their openers over and over again. But is there a better version of Shadow Dance? So we redesigned Shadow Dance. It's now a passive ability. Every time you do a finishing move, you have a 20% chance per combo point to re-enter stealth. And that stealth does not break from taking damage. So you have a chance to figure out what you want to do, do a new opener, do that core routine that every rogue really wants to do. You do your, your opener, your combos, your finishers, and repeat. No other rogue gets to do that. It's very distinct and different. To add further to that, 
we added one of my favorite new abilities is it really feeds off Shadow Dance. It's called Shadow Strike. What it is, is it lets them teleport to a target anywhere in the battlefield and do ambush level damage to that target as an opener. So you're fighting away at a target, you know, you cheap shot, do some combos, do a finisher, teleport across the room, beat up that guy, they all come for you, and you teleport again somewhere else. You're a true ninja, moving around wherever you want to be. I mean, it's going to be a lot of fun. Along the way, some generic rogue abilities, things that were cool but not really part of that fantasy got removed, like Honor Among Thieves, but it's been replaced by things that are much more central to that fantasy. Finally, I want to talk to you about how we made the game more immersive. Let's start with the demonology warlock. So we think back to Warcraft orcs versus humans. Warlocks were about summoning demons and using them to destroy the alliance, right? Somehow over the years, we kind of got lost from that on the Demonology Warlock. They're about turning into a demon. They should be about summoning demons, hordes of demons to destroy their enemies. So we completely redesigned the Demonology Warlock. They have more new minions to summon than ever before, buffing them and sending those minions out to attack is a core part of their combat rotation. But they're not about turning into a demon anymore. Metamorphosis is really the domain of the demon hunter, but Demonology has even more cool stuff to replace it. A similar example can be found with the Guardian Druid. You imagine a Guardian Druid, they should be like a grizzly bear, this giant wall of flesh and fur and bone that you just can't get past. It's immovable. But instead, they're all about dodging from place to place. Like, that doesn't make any sense. So they're no longer the dodgy circus bear. They're all about increased health, increased armor, increased survivability, and being, being what people really imagine them to be. Finally, on the, the topic of immersive, we took a hard look at the Shadow Priests. They always kind of felt like the poor cousin of the Affliction Warlock. They've got lots of cool things. They've got mind abilities, they've got damage over time, they've got vampiric abilities, but they don't really fit together into a cohesive whole. So we thought, well, what, what is a Shadow Priest really about? They're about tapping into the powers of the Void. And who controls the Void but the old gods? And working with the power of the old gods, that causes you to, well, if you think about the Cho'Gall encounter or fighting yogg Saron, you slowly lose mind, your mind. You go insane. So the new resource for Shadow Priests is insanity. They no longer have mana or shadow orbs. They tap into the power of insanity, gradually going more and more insane and using that as a source of energy. Their shadow form gets darker and darker. They start to grow tentacles from out of their body until they transform into void form. <laughs> As insanity builds, they get stronger and stronger. As they enter void form, they get more and more powerful the longer they can stay there. But insanity was not meant for mortal men to control. They can only hold on for so long. Their insanity slowly drains away. But the more insanity they can generate while they're there, the longer they can stay there, the more powerful they get. So they have ultimate but fleeting power they have control over. Before I go, I'd like to talk a little bit about talents. We have one of our biggest talent revisions we've done since Mr. of Pandaria. Still the same format, seven rows with three things in them. But we've gotten rid of a lot of those theme rows. You know where like, there's a row that says pick AOE1 or AOE2 or AOE3. It's really all kind of the same thing. And it doesn't really feel that cool. Now those will be in different rows from each other. There's more choices that matter. There's more ways to customize your character. And there's more talents that are specific to your spec, not shared with the other two or three. And as a result, that means there are literally hundreds of new talents coming out in Legion. More talents than there ever been in any previous expansion. <laughs> One last comment. I'm going to be over at the uh, Darkman Fair later this afternoon if you have questions about this. And starting tomorrow, there's going to be a series of blogs detailing every single one of our classes and specs, what their core abilities are now, some, some examples of some of their talents that are coming, so you can get a sense of what's coming soon as we, as we move into beta. With that, I'm going to hand it to Paul Cubitt. Talk to you about professions. Hello. Hello. Hey, great. Thanks, Chris. Uh, my name's Paul. I'm a game designer on World of Warcraft, and today I'm going to talk about professions. So let's get right into it. So the biggest thing we wanted to do in Legion, as far as professions are concerned, is to give you more stuff to do. Uh, that, what does that mean? Well, it means I'll paint you a picture. Let's say it's Sunday afternoon, you log into WoW, uh, you got a couple hours to kill, 
but you're not really feeling that quest line you're working on, your raid doesn't, you, know, you don't do raids on Sundays, uh, you kind of just want to work on your alchemy or your blacksmithing. Well, we think you should be able to do that, and we don't want to hold you back from doing that. So the first way we're going to attack that is with recipe acquisition. So gone are the days when you kind of log into a new expansion and you find your trainer and, okay, click, 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 click. Okay, I know every recipe I need to know for the entire expansion. I mean, some of that's okay. Trainers are still good. But we also want you to get out in the world and kind of carve your own path, find some recipes your friends haven't found yet, uh, meet some cool characters, go on adventures. Now, an example of how that might look is in the case of tailoring. As a tailor, uh, you'll go to Dalaran, your adventure starts there, you meet your trainer. Uh, she wants to find out what kind of cloth they have in the Broken Isles. Uh, and it is cloth this time, it's not fur. So you go uh, uh, down in the world. I thought fur was cool, but... Uh, you, <laughs> you get some cloth, you bring it back, and you start to sew with her. Uh, you start to make a robe, but the cloth is rejecting the thread you're putting in. It's got falling apart, it's making a huge mess. You need to find someone who knows how to work with this material. So you go out in the world into one of our new zones, Azuna, and you meet Lindris. Uh, Lindris is a Nightfallen, which means he's an exiled member of the Nightborn tribe of elves. Nightfallen typically have issues with magical cravings. But anyways, he's very friendly. He, uh, he helps you with your sewing problem. He teaches you a bunch of new patterns. He's also very interested in that magical floating city in the sky you came from. And a lot of the rest of your quest line deals with continuing to learn patterns from Lindris, uh, dealing with the aftermath of bringing him to a city of temptation, uh, and then eventually going to Suramar and kind of finding out why he was exiled and why his people got so good at tailoring. Now, this kind of recipe acquisition isn't simply limited to crafters. Gatherers get a lot of love, too. Uh, as a miner, for example, you'll be learning from characters like uh, Rethu uh, here. He is, uh, he's dead, you could tell. He's also very into mining. Uh, but from characters like him and others, uh, you'll learn how to more efficiently mine some of the new materials, like laystone, uh, one of our new ores. Uh, while I'm on the subject of gathering, I want to uh, share a story with you guys. I was out gathering herbs on my character a couple weeks back, and I, I saw an herb I wanted to pick, so I started running towards it. And then this druid came down and kind of picked it right in front of me and then flew away. He didn't even say anything. Has this happened to anybody else, too? I think it's the same guy. Well, that's not going to happen anymore in Legion because mining nodes and herbalism nodes will be shared. So the druid gets the herb, I get the herb, my friend who's out gathering herbs with me gets the herb, everybody's happy. So, okay, you've gone through the mining or tailoring or whatever the uh, recipe acquisition is. You've learned all your recipes, you're done, right? Well, you can be if you want to, sure, but if you're really interested in continuing to work on your professions, like I said, we don't want to hold you back from doing that. So we have the concept of recipe ranks, where there's two-star and three-star recipes out in the world, some of which are very rare and prestigious. You can go hunt down and, and earn, and they'll make you more efficient at making the things you already know how to make. Here's an example of how that looks in our UI. So you can see this guy, he's got a two-star rating and binding a mastery there, and one... Actually, you know what, this, this UI is starting to look a little cramped and maybe a little dated. Let's just blow it out a little bit. Much better, okay. <laughs> so m maybe a long overdue update to the trade skill UI, but yes, you have a bigger list of recipes on the left, details of the selected recipe on the right. Uh, a couple things I want to point out to you, there's also a favorites list up at top, so maybe you're that alchemist who says, I just make flasks, man, that's all I do. Great. You can take those one or two flasks you make every week, pull them up to the top. You don't have to look through 400 potions anymore. I also want to point out that there's a learned and an unlearned tab as well. So now you'll be able to see the list of recipes you don't know, as well as details of where to find them. You can complete that collection. Now, going back to those two-star and three-star recipes, those are mostly going to give you efficiency. You're going to get more efficient, you know, uh, craft with fewer materials, less time, and so on. If you want to make something more powerful, then you need something called obliterum. Now, obliterum is this demonic ash or dust that you can use to increase the power level of your crafted items. And interestingly, it comes from crafted items. So I'll explain. Once you hit level 110, you're going to stumble upon a quest line which will culminate in you building this big, radical, demon hunter-inspired forge in the middle of Dalaran called the obliterum forge. And you can use that to convert crafted items you no longer want or need into obliterum. Maybe you're a jewel crafter, and you want to make yourself a ring with just the right stats for you. So you make a ring, and of course it has the wrong stats. So you do make, again, and three, four, five, six, seven rings until you've got the one, yeah, the exact ring you wanted. Perfect. 
you put it on, seems to fit all right. Now with these other six rings, you could vendor them, sure. You could sell them on the auction house, or now you could take them to the obliterum forge, convert them into obliterum, and use that to increase the power level of the ring you're already wearing. So bringing it all back. It's Sunday afternoon. You got this time to spend. If you haven't learned all your recipes, well, you can go on an adventure. Go complete the, the, your recipe acquisition. If you uh, have already learned all your recipes, well, you can go hunt down some of those two-star, three-star uh, recipes that are hidden out there in the world. Or if you just want to make more powerful gear, powerful gear for yourself or your guildies, uh, well, you can do that too. And also turn it into obliterum, make your gear more powerful. Plenty of stuff to do. You shouldn't be running out of content. Let's talk about some of the things you'll be making. Uh, we want crafted gear to feel special. It shouldn't just be a carbon copy of raid gear. One of the places I think we've done that pretty well in the past is in the case of uh, engineering goggles. They don't feel like normal helms, and this expansion is no different. This time they're made out of guns and gun parts. So there's actually like a gun here, and a scope here, and a trigger here. And the reason why, you'll find out when you play through the quest line as an engineer. But as a result, you can shoot bullets at enemies with your head, which already feels very different than any other helm in the game. Different doesn't always mean adding a clicky effect. Uh, take, for example, this necklace here. Uh, all high-level necklaces and rings made by jewel crafters have a guaranteed gem slot in them, which is already different than anywhere else in the game. Uh, and it's also smart of the jewel crafter, right? Because they can sell you the gem along with it. Like, would you like some crit with that? Uh, but in addition, this particular neck has a class-specific buff on it. And this is for a warrior. So if you're a warrior, you want to get that buff. One of the best ways to do that is to hunt out a jewel crafter or be one yourself. <clears throat> Let's talk about inscription. Where are my scribes at? <laughs> Hi, scribes. Okay, in Legion, there's going to be a lot of ways that you can customize the way that your character plays. We have all those talents that Chris talked about. We have PvP talents, which we didn't talk about today. We have the artifact and the artifact traits. All of these are going to greatly affect the way that your character's rotation works. And with all this customization in place, glyphs were starting to feel a little redundant. So, in Legion, we've removed major glyphs from the game. They no longer exist. Uh, I can already hear like murmurs from scribes going, no, no, my cash flow. What are you, why are you punishing us? Well, we're still thinking about you guys. Don't worry. First of all, you still make the powerful Dark Moon, fair, uh, Dark Moon cards, the trinkets that are as desirable as they've always been. Uh, secondly, we still have minor glyphs. These are the more player preference or cosmetic uh, glyphs. Uh, and they're going to work a little differently. Instead of being learned, they're going to be applied as a consumable directly to the spell. It's kind of neat. You just right-click the item, and then it opens up the spell book, and you apply it to the spell. And then you can see the effect of the glyph on the spell there. Uh, you are still limited to one glyph per spell, but we've removed the restriction of three total glyphs. So you can glyph as many spells as you want. And in addition to round out the scribes, we've added a new co uh, consumable called the Vantis Rune. And this is a way of calling out a particular boss you want to take it to. Uh, it's a week-long buff. You can only use one per week. It lasts the whole week. Uh, and say, for example, this one uh, does more damage to Xavius. Maybe your guild is having trouble getting past heroic Xavius. Your, gu your guild leader says, all right, guys, we're all going to get Vantis Runes for Xavius. We're going to do way more damage to him. We're going to get past this brick wall and move on to the next brick wall. Uh, OK. I'm gonna talk real quick about all the secondary professions that we share. Archaeologists are going to be taken on an expansion-length campaign that's revealed over several months. Uh, it's going to take you to all the different corners of Azeroth. Well, you're going to find lots of cool things to display with a particular focus on things that you can use, equip, wear, uh, use as pets, and so on. Uh, cooking. This here is Nomi. Uh, you may remember him from Pandaria. He's grown up a little bit. Uh, he's going to be joining your team again as your sous chef. You bring him ingredients, and he's going to help you discover some new recipes that you can use with those ingredients. Also, for the first time in World of Warcraft history, you will be able to cook bacon. <laughs> fishing. We want fishing to feel more like an adventure. When you fish, you should be thinking, oh, fishing, I wonder what's going to happen to me today, and not, Oh, fishing, I wonder what I'm going to watch on my second monitor. <laughs> and finally, first aid, we have lots of exciting new bandage-related content coming from you. You have two more bandages with slightly higher numbers than before. It's going to be great. I love first aid. <laughs> Can't get enough first aid. So there's a whole lot more we have planned, but that's all the time we have for professions today. Coming up next, Matt Goss is going to talk about items, itemization, and a little bit more. All right. Thank you, Paul. So coming into Legion, uh, we really, our, our main goal for itemization was to bring excitement back into the world. And 
one of the ways we did this is we went back to a system that we used to have in WoW and thought what would have happened if we actually took it and put it into Legion. So maybe these items will look familiar to you guys. There's a freezing band. These are all classic items, Cloudkeeper leg plates, Cloak of Flames. So these were rare world drops. And we said, this, was, this is a uh, system that we want to take in. So what would these look like in Legion? So these are items that are rare. Um, they drop from anywhere in the world. So if you remember back to classic, you may have only seen one or two of them as you were playing through. Uh, we want to make sure that the power of these is actually relevant through the expansion. Because they're rare and they're hard to find, we want to make sure when you get one, it's actually something you want to keep and hold on to throughout the expansion. And finally, we want to kind of expand the unique effects that were there in, in, in Classic. And you saw a lot of you know, role-specific effects or something that's very specific to uh, or, or more utility-based. Uh, we actually wanted to do effects that are role-based or class-based or maybe even spec-based. So, all right, so if you go back and you think about what it was like in 2004, and these were epic items, right? So they stood out. You, had a, you maybe had some, you know, a full set of blues, but purple items are really, really hard, you know, really, really hard to get and, and hard to see. So um, what would this look like in Legion? So what these items look like in Legion is they look like this. So yes, it's a, that is a legendary. Um, so this legendary actually has an effect on it where uh, your damage over time effects and healing over time effects have a chance to do their full duration of the effect that's left every single tick they, they go through. So yeah, it's, it's pretty big. Um, so if you're an Affliction Warlock, if you're a Resto Druid, this item is amazing. If you're not one of those people, maybe one of these, Maybe one of those, or maybe one of those will be useful. So we're going to make as many as we, we're going to try to make a lot of these and you know, actually kind of spice up the, the item game a little bit more. Um, all the effects we're still working on, so kind of a preview taste. All right, so in addition to legendaries, uh, I should also mention, too, um, so when we say that they're rare, it doesn't mean that they're fully random. And I think that was probably one of the things we wanted to fix when we looked at the original, uh, the original system. So for Legion, we'll actually have better ways for you to find them. We'll have ways that you can target specific ones. Uh, we'll have more details about that in the future. So also, um, in Legion, every item that drops in the world in Legion can actually scale up. And farther than Warforged, actually can scale all the way up to the best items in the game. So I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, oh my god, I'm going to have to run normal dungeons for 20 hours in order to get gear. And that's not the intent. And the intent is still the, most, the best way to get gear is going to be the most difficult content. If you want higher item level, you're still going to go do higher difficulty content. And also, uh, duplicate personal loot can now be traded. <laughs> so. Yeah, um, so the way this works is uh, if you have an item that drops at a power level in a slot that is equal to or less than what you already have gotten in the past, um, you'll actually be able to trade it to anybody else on the tap list. So we hope that that helps out personal loot. All right, so let's talk about something completely different. Let's talk about transmog. So we love transmog, and we knew that there were some problems with it that we wanted to address. And so our goals coming into Legion were pretty clear. Um, we wanted to get all those items that are in your bank, in your inventory, in your void storage. We wanted to help you clean those up. So if you're keeping those items around, we want to help with that. Uh, we want to expand customization as well. I think that was, there's always more things we can add, and there's a few more that we're, we're going to be able to do. And finally, collection. And if you go to you know, my bank, I'm sure a lot of these guys and a lot of you guys, the reason you're keeping these around is because you like the collection part. You like having your tier one, tier two, and you know, kind of checking those things off. So we want to keep that, that feeling going forward. So we're going to introduce the wardrobe. So the wardrobe, as soon as an item is bound to you, the appearance is automatically unlocked into your collection. And once you unlock it, you can toss the item 
You can get rid of it, DE it, obliterate it, whatever you want to do. And yes, so it's a cow wide. You have to be able to equip the item in order to unlock it. So if you have, but what it does mean is if you have a paladin who has just a, a play chess piece, and a death knight who has a play chess piece, it will unlock when one of them gets it. So it's pretty cool. So this is what the UI looks like. So, so yeah, so the left side is going to look very familiar to you. Um, that's you know, kind of the, the, where you can see which items are, are currently transmogged. The right side is the new wardrobe UI. So when you're transmogging to the vendor, you'll see this UI. Uh, when you're out in the field, you'll actually see the wardrobe UI, so you can you know, kind of check, keep track of your collection and what things you want to get. At the top, you can see a bar that says 16 of 527. So that's how many helms this person has unlocked. Uh, they have a lot of work to do. Uh, and we also wanted to, again, going back to the customization options, one of the biggest pains with transmog is you're kind of keeping sets together, and it's hard to keep track of which items are where. Um, so we've added outfits to transmog as well. So outfits are pretty simple. You can just store what you currently look like as an outfit. Um, but what's also cool is you can trade, you can actually link that outfit to other people, and so they can, you know, take on your outfit. Even if you don't have all the appearances unlocked, it'll actually give you kind of a little bit of a shopping list to find those things in the future. All right, so I'm not done. <laughs> so when you log into Legion, Every item that's in your bank, your void storage, your inventory, they're automatically going to get put into your collection, assuming that they're bound to you. We are also going to go back and look at every quest you've ever completed, and we're going to unlock that appearance. That includes items you may not have even chosen. So, yeah. So if you had a choice between the chest piece and the shield, we're just going to unlock both of them for you. All right, still not done. So you can also save different outfits per specialization. So let's say you're a shadow priest and a holy you know, your, your two specs are shadow and holy. When you switch to shadow, you can actually save out a completely separate transmog look. So whenever you change specs, it'll keep up with you. Still not done. So you can actually hide slots. So if you want to hide your cloak and your helm, you can actually save that out per outfit. So if you really like the pirate hat, you can keep the pirate hat in, in that outfit, but not in your other outfits. We're also allowing you to hide shoulders in Legion. All right, still not done. Three new transmogable slots. So first one, weapon enchants. In Warlords, we introduced the enchanting hut with illusions. You can now get through those. We're unlocking shirts. And finally, we are unlocking tabards. So yeah, so that's, we're really excited about that. All right, guys, thank you so much. We are out of time today. It's as much as we could fit in. Please send us feedback on everything you've seen. 30 minutes from now on this stage, we're going to be doing Q&A, and we're going to answer all the questions that you guys have submitted already and the ones that were submitted online. So thank you very much. Have a great BlizzCon. Thank you for attending the World of Warcraft Legion Game Systems panel. Up next, World of Warcraft Q&A.